Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the last session of the last day. Uh, glad everyone showed up, and uh, I applaud you for coming out and sticking around. Uh, it's going to be a casual session. You know, we are right next to the beach. So, uh, and I also, uh, someone wiped out my battery cable on the plane out here. So it's as long as I have juice on my laptop. Uh, it should be about five hours or so. Right? That work for everyone? Okay. So uh, my name is Charles Hudson. My background is I've been an entrepreneur in the space. Uh, I work for a home control and automation company now. Uh, so I deal with AV media all the time. And I also teach in the e-commerce and computer science field. So today we'll be talking about the second screen experience. And it was kind of uh, interesting while I was waiting outside getting a uh, drink, a couple of fellows were talking and they, they were looking at the agenda for the talk and uh, mentioned just haphazardly, well, I don't know about the second screen experience, whether it's actually gonna stick around, what the use case is for it, so I don't think I'm gonna go. So uh, again, I applaud you, and we'll actually be talking about what the use has been over the last several years, and where do we see it going from here? And some prime examples as this area matures and grows, okay? So what do we, we'll talk about what do we mean by second screen. Uh, we'll also cover just some statistics that have come out recently over the past couple years from people like Nielsen and some other studies going on. When we talk about second screen, we also talk about synchronization of content with streams of information. So we'll be talking about that and tools, some companion apps and how those are formed. We'll talk casting, and then finally, we'll actually dig into a little bit of code, just to give you a quick example to see how easy it is nowadays with some SDKs of being able to cast your own material through a mobile device or through a laptop device and actually put context around it. So some interesting discussions. Okay, so when we talk about secondary screens, we're really talking about any interface outside of the primary TV, right? Outside of that primary large interface where people are used to their streaming media coming in now with smart TVs and the like, we have our mobile devices, our tablets, and our laptops as well. In the future, there may be other devices that have screens that interact and are able to control, able to stream, and the like to this primary screen. So some usage statistics, since 2011, We've seen a really large change in this space, okay? Uh, you can actually see the yellow bars there are where people are using devices when they're watching TVs. So the yellow bars are the tallest bars. That's where the people are most likely to use their actual secondary screens, their tablet interfaces and their smartphones, okay? And the stats are 68 to 70% of the time while they're watching TV, they're using a tablet or smartphone. However, we need to drill down a little bit further, especially in the uh, video streaming field and the programming field, to understand what they're really using those devices for, because it could just be web browsing, checking the weather, sending emails to their mother, whatever it may be. We want to actually see what the important actions are in that demographic. So here's a report from Nielsen that came out with exactly that. They asked people, what are you actually using your smartphone or tablet for while you're watching TV? Okay, and every box that's highlighted in green has to do with something around programming. The top one there looked up program-related information. Okay, that could be anything from cast member information, plots, additional episodes, any in the, anything in that space. Okay, so where are the eyeballs then? Are they actually on the smart device or are they actually on the TV? Okay. Optimally, we want them in the programming space. We want them viewing that, that media. Okay. But let's look at it from the other side, from the social side. If they are actually integrating, interacting with their smart device, their tablet, their phone, one of those areas that we know that they are based on just some uh, stats around new premieres and NFL partnerships is they're going to Twitter, okay? So Twitter actually commissioned a study with Fox Research and in that study they asked users, how are you, what do you actually do when you see a tweet on a specific show? 
In this case, 90% of users who see a tweet on a show are more likely to view and interact. They're engaged. So it's very interesting. They're actually reading the social context and then engaging from that. Okay? And then some other stats around that. You know, what type of tweets are more important and more engaging than others? And what happens during live broadcasts? Which when the second screen comes into account, plays very highly. So let's look at categories of usage. Here's our basic divisions that we have. Interaction, so that's such things as polls or prediction mechanisms when I'm actually looking at a live broadcast. We have information. We also saw that the top ranking use of a mobile device was actually seeking out information about that show, about that premiere, about that programming. Then we have social and ads or commerce. The social feed we saw with Twitter, definitely an important factor. And then in the ad commerce, commerce space, actually making purchases of things like, what is that actor wearing for a jacket? Or if I'm watching a game, that I can actually purchase a fan jersey of a player. So some very interesting models, and this is where we also drive some of the revenue around second screens. So, but if they're not looking at the actual programming all the time, we have what's been called a viewer deficit syndrome. Okay, we're not getting the eyeballs. So we have lower percentages of people looking at ads, as an example, looking at those mechanisms that fund this programming. And we have a problem then. We want to drive engagement to those other ads. We want to drive engagement to the programming itself. Okay, if their eyeballs are on the secondary devices, there's a problem there, there's a challenge. So to drive that engagement, we look at things like cross-platform content. If I'm showing on the TV a certain program that the content associated on the mobile device, on the tablet or on the phone, is exactly in line with that same program. For example, if I'm showing an ad for a car on the program currently, that ad should be available, or the content for that ad should be available on the manufacturer's website, prominently displayed, and right in front for the user to, uh, to view. Okay. So that's where we bring in syncing. And syncing really is that timeline adjustment where we're providing content externally from that second, second device, second screen, whether it be website content or mobile content, such as ads, ad campaigns. And we're syncing those together to make it a much more engaging experience. And there's three ways to do that. The simplest is we ask the user, OK? You're on your mobile device. What are you watching at this time? And there are several sites around mobile sites, mobile apps that actually do this. And here's an example of TV tag down below. What are you watching currently? And it's a little bit smart enough for suggestive searching. As I start typing in W-A-L-K, it will come up with Walking Dead as an example. Okay? Or Gold for Gold Rush. It will prompt me for those shows. I can also do synchronous live timing. So I have a live broadcast. And what I've done during that broadcast is I've mapped out the segments in that broadcast to certain content on a secondary website that can be viewed by the mobile device, by the smartphone, or the tablet. And then the last is, and typically not used by uh, custom programming folks, but more third parties, is I actually do dynamic content identification, auto content recognition. And we'll talk about some of these as we go. Okay. So the benefit for this is now we can actually specify when we want ad placements done. Okay, and further engage those, those folks that may be looking at the live stream. Okay. We can define different tracks of activity. So for example, if I'm watching a tennis match, for the first part of the tennis match, I might have information about the players, their current rankings, their history, on those secondary screens. As I go further in the match, that content, those activities might change. You might have an activity where it's a poll. Who do you think is going to take first set? in this match. Okay. So we can change that content on the fly. A lot of neat things around this. It's very similar to if you're familiar with things like captioning and video, you have tracks of time 
where you're assigning extra content to that track. But we do have challenges with this. We have to know up front you know, what the timing is, or roughly we need to be able to change on the fly if possible when those contents or activities uh, need adjusting. And we need to also be able to do the analytics. How much of a benefit are we getting from having this secondary content? And the content may not be live. We may have stored content. Okay. So that brings up dynamic identification. And dynamic identification is really based around a technology called ACR, or auto content recognition. And auto content rec recognition is very similar if you've heard of the apps SoundHound or Shazam, where they're identifying music. So I'm sitting in my car listening to a song on the radio, and I like the song. I can bring up SoundHound on my mobile device, and it will actually fingerprint based on the audio patterns of what it's hearing, what that song is from its database. It's the same technology for video. I can either do it via the audio spectrum, or I can actually hold up my video camera on my phone and point it at the television, and actually, based on the patterns it recognizes, actually recognize what I'm watching, okay? And also where in that program I'm at currently. So this is interesting because now not only do we have the context of what, but exactly where in the program I am so I can trigger different activities, different tracks to happen on supplemental information, like the websites, like the mobile ads, and the like, okay? I gave an example of one. Now this is a very interesting example because this was based, uh, Into Now was one of the first groups that actually did this with the NAP, and Into Now was actually bought by Yahoo in 2011, and they just actually closed it down this year. Very interestingly. What they did say, though, is they're taking that technology and they're actually migrating it into some of their other products. Okay, so Yahoo Sports TV is one of them, uh, and then the smart TVs as well that they have. Okay, so, but with that, what Into Now would do, and you can see the icon on the top, it would actually identify what you're watching and based on that, pull up that episode and allow you to pull up information about that episode, pull up the plot, pull up the cast members, et cetera. Okay. So, and the real power behind ACR, as we mentioned, is we now have track and position. Okay, if you're used to programming around videos and uh, doing things like HTML5 video, as an example, with embedded e-commerce, this is exactly the type of informa information you need. Where am I in the video, and what video is the person looking at? Okay. So one company that's been working on this uh, more recently is IDTV from Nant Mobile, and they provide an ACR from the mobile device. And the interesting thing here as a developer, they also provide an SDK. So not only can I rebrand their own app, but I can also use their SDK that provides me the ACR for the engine behind the scenes of fingerprinting that video and identifying what the user is, is uh, watching. Okay, so with this, as this market has grown, we've also seen some platforms come up. And these platforms are growing, they're adding features. Uh, there's a wide range now, and we're seeing both generic platforms and also vertical specific platforms. Uh, one, for example, in the sports area is the last one there listed, K-W-A-R-T-E-R. -E they actually specify and focus on gamification. Okay, so they're actually looking at uh, typically the sports industry, games, bidding, uh, betting, and the like. All these platforms typically include ACR because, of course, that's that dynamic feature that allows us the identification and it provides syncing of site and ads based on display times. So this is where the platform concept comes in. It's not just an SDK to put into an iOS or Android app, but it's actually a platform to interact with your website files, actually modify live what the website may be showing. Okay. And here's an example of one of these platforms. So this company worked with Hyundai uh, on a promotion campaign with a uh, car promotion, an ad, and what it did is they used a technology, they in fact call it a live sync, 
which will synchronize based on the current ad what is shown on your website on the front page. So if I'm a user and I'm looking and I'm, I see an ad, I typically will just put in a website for that uh, product, right? The benefit here is when I get to that website, the very first thing I see is in coordination with what I've seen on the t television, what I've just watched or listened to. And there's a window of time when this is applicable. Okay, if I'm too early, the ad's not up. If I'm too late, I've lost most of the people. So I wanna make sure that that content on the site is live when the ad comes up. And in these platforms, they're listening to these channels, and when they hear the ad, when they recognize that your ad is playing, they'll actually work with your website directly to modify things like front page landings, okay? It can be d drilled down all the way down to the geographic level. And the benefits are, in this case, it cut the bounce rate off the website in half, which is very powerful. And the live syncing with the website increased engagement 50%, okay? Some very powerful stats around that second screen. Okay, so let's talk about companion apps. And these are applications that are typically developed purposely for being a, a companion to a programming uh, series or from a programming uh, specific channel. And the purpose of companion apps, to drive these interactions, to drive further engagement, to get in deeper with our fan base, our viewers who are watching our content. Okay, so naturally around that, we have things like social feeds, live content interaction. So if I'm watching the premiere of Gold Rush, I might be able to vote as to what the outcome is and get and see what other people are voting. Typically what people were driving the social side for and tweeting, now they're actually bringing into the apps. Metadata on the programs and viewable content, supplemental content. Content that makes the viewer feel like they're part of the family around this programming, special to them. Okay? So as we said, pro provides interactions greater than streaming. It's much deeper analytics as well. So now we have the benefit of the user actually interacting and engaging rather than just being a viewer, absorbing the content. So now the marketing and the analytics folks have a tremendous amount of data at their use at their assets to employ and determine, okay, which segments of the episode worked well, which did not, not only for marketing, but also for the actual content creators, the programming directors, okay? So a lot of benefit there. Okay, prime example of this, and probably the group that's taken it to the furthest point at this point, is AMC, okay? Have people seen the AMC StorySync technology at all? Okay, so if you download the app from either of the app stores on iOS or Android or even go to the website, this is straight from their website, uh, they have this, what they've branded Story Sync, and you can see it up in the upper right next to the Walking Dead uh, banner. Story Sync, sounds very familiar, we're syncing a story in media to content outside, exactly what the second screen is meant for. And in this case, their description is available during select season story sync, a live interactive experience that allows you to vote in snap polls, answer cool trivia, and relive tense moments. So we're getting that emotional factor. We're actually driving that engagement more. And the analytics bonus on this is just over the course of one season, there were greater than one million individuals that actually viewed story sync, whether it be through mobile devices or through their laptop browser at any, at, uh, over the season. Okay, and here's, as an, as an example, one of their polls, uh, season four, episode eight of Walking Dead, who kills the most walkers of this episode? So you get to vote who your character is. Again, getting that engagement and allowing the person to actually be involved much more. And from something they're already using in the living room watching TV, in their primary use case for these mobile devices. As well, just as a note up on the upper right, they've embedded directly the social interaction. So if someone wants to like this page in Facebook, they can snap to it right there. If they want to tweet to their friends and family, they can go right to that link. Okay. 
So some of the benefits, we've talked about social TV. We can add much more information and much more robust interactions now, trivia, predictions, feed integration, special segments even. Okay, what's the reward to the viewers? Uh, if you're in the gamification space, people are doing things like providing people points if they win a poll, uh, providing badges, giving them some credibility, some popularity, and even giving them some rewards, depending on whether it's a competition, between the viewers, things like that. And so the key here is the viewer is now really becoming an active participant, providing feedback, providing that engagement. And we haven't really capitalized on that viewer yet, okay? So one of the quotes recently was, we're still in the business of driving business, but through happy viewers, okay? And that was from one of the channel providers. So then we get into some interesting things. We've talked about mobile. We've talked about the second screen being laptops. Uh, we've talked about the content predominantly being programming or streaming, uh, possibly from a media player. But now we have this not so new entrant. It's been around for a while, but now it's becoming more commonplace, and that's screencasting. Okay? Throwing media from the mobile device to a TV. Okay. And the content source, as we've discussed, Content typically going to the TV, maybe going through a media player or Roku or any of the streaming uh, services, the smart TVs. Uh, but now we're actually taking our mobile device and we're interacting with a media player, which could be a box or what I'm calling this year the year of the stick, any of the sticks that are out there now. Your Roku stick, your Chromecast, your Amazon Fire TV stick, okay? Any of these. Anybody recognize the one on the bottom left? The very nondescript one? No? Okay. So lots of education are going, is going on as well on these sticks. That's actually the w Microsoft Wireless Display Adapter. Okay? So we're, we're definitely at the nascent start of this area of the business because we have names like this and people are trying to be educated. You know, if we look at just briefly the Microsoft YouTube video on this, we'll see if it comes up. They're trying to describe what this wireless adapter actually is and how it can be used. They also win for the longest name. Okay, so they're showing business side, they're showing family side on this. Now, they're typically streaming media players. We can interact with them with our mobile devices. We can actually cast, we can throw media to them as it was showing in the video. We can cast PowerPoints, we can cast YouTube. Uh, various different pieces of information. There's also Chromecast. And Chromecast I'm going to spend a little bit of time on because it has some unique features that the others are just starting to look at, uh, although Roku's had it for a little while, and we'll get into it here. But it's Google's casting entry, okay? $35 retail. If you haven't seen it, this is what it looks like in Best Buy. You can pick it up. Most Best Buys have it. Uh, multiple devices can actually cast to the stick. So this is a very interesting uh, situation. I might have a family, I might be playing a game on TV and each family member uses their mobile device to actually interact with the Chromecast stick. So I can actually have multiple devices connected to one Chromecast stick at any time. I can't have one, I can't have one mobile device cast to multiple Chromecast sticks at the same time, but multiple devices can cast to one Chromecast stick, which makes very interesting. Uh, there's a full series of apps, and several of these we've seen already. You know, you can have YouTube, there's Netflix, very similar across the spectrum of streaming media players. But why is it special interest? And we'll see in a minute. I can cast from Chrome, so I add an extension in, and the extension just goes right into Chrome, and then I get a 
casting icon up in the upper right. Any tab that I have in, in Chrome, I can then cast straight to the Chrome stick. It will take that content and launch it on the TV. Okay, so pretty, pretty standard here so far. YouTube Chromecast, very similar to the other uh, sticks that are out there. Okay, I can have my interface that's on my mobile device on the right here. On the center is what I'm actually seeing on the TV. And the neat thing here is that the, what you see on the TV is actually based on a receiver app on the Chromecast stick. So we actually have two pieces. We have a sender app, which in this case is a YouTube Chromecast enabled app on the mobile device, which is on the right, and a receiver app, which is on the stick itself, listening for messages from the actual sender app. So here, the neat thing on the right-hand side with YouTube, I can actually append videos to my TV queue. You can see it's playing in the theater room, and it shows the little icon on the top for it currently being cast. And I can do that while the media is actually playing, while the interface on the TV is, is live. So I can be adjusting that queue. Okay. So here's the neat thing about Chromecast. Given it comes from Google, it's not surprising that they've actually made it as a developer platform. Okay. Some of the other sticks you can, but there's a public SDK with Google, several APIs, and that's what we'll go through very briefly because it opens up a wide spectrum here of solutions. So Chromecast, as an example for a development platform, developers can, ca can cast using a Google Cast SDK. It supports Chrome, as we've already seen, but it also supports with native libraries and frameworks, Android and iOS. So if you're an iOS developer and you want to be able to cast uh, your content, okay, or you want to make a companion app, Okay, you can actually then cast directly to the TV via the Chrome stick through this SDK that's very easy to do, and we'll see in a minute uh, with Chromecast. Okay, two components, the sender and receiver, as I said. The receiver app you don't have to build. The receiver app can use just a default media receiver that's actually built into the Chromecast stick, or you can write your own receiver. So you can lay out the content exactly as you wish, drive more content, more interaction. This is where people are creating things like tic-tac-toe games with two people playing it on their TV. Okay? They're actually not casting any information except for the messages back and forth as to where they're actually moving on the board, on the game. Okay? Note if you do have a receiver app, you must register that app in, at Google, and that's how they actually recognize it on the Chromecast sticks. Okay, and here's the basic life cycle. So if I'm inter integrating any of these SDKs into Chrome, iOS, or Android, this is a typical flow that I would follow. I would load the sender app. I would initialize the API, API that comes with the SDK. Okay, I would discover devices. If you're in Chrome, this is actually handled by the Chrome browser for you, by the extension. Okay, but otherwise, what it's going to do is it's actually going to look out and say, okay, what other, uh, what other Chromecast devices are out there and which one do you want to connect to? Each Chromecast stick has a micro Wi-Fi built into it that will actually broadcast out and you can link to. Request a session with that particular receiver and then send and receive messages once I get a session object back that's valid. Once I'm done, I simply terminate it. I disconnect from that session. Okay? Very easy to do. An iOS developer or an Android or even a web developer can literally set this up in a matter of hours, basically, uh, really tuned around what functionality and features you want to have and the complexity uh, based on the SDKs and examples that they provide. So here's what's provided by uh, Google right now with the Google Cast. And you can go up to, you can see this at developers.google.com slash cast, but it provides a whole series of APIs, okay, which include documentation about the various objects, including the media object and the session object. Cast icons, so if you want to use the default cast icons, you can. Sample apps, and then lots of documentation, including what the current architecture is for this. Okay. 
So let's go through a uh, quick sender example. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the futures. So Chrome sender example is through the cast extension again, so which is completely free. The sender app is composed of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Okay? And what you get actually from Google and the cast SDK is just a JavaScript library. Okay? Some notes on that library. It handles all the communication, so you don't have to worry about that. It handles the media object, so it exposes several methods of that media object. And then it also uses a namespace that has to match. So that is one key that you, that you do when you're developing this. So the first thing we're going to do is detect if cast is available. And that simply is a cast extension embedded in Chrome. We do that simply with a Chrome object, is available. And based on that, we can then move to the next step of initializing the sender API. And here's where we actually initialize it in the last step based on a session request and an API config that we set up beforehand. Okay? And that's just passing some listeners across that we want callbacks to go to. Okay. In this example, note that the first line, for those of you that may use this, I've used the default media receiver app ID. What that means is that the receiver app on the Chrome stick is actually, I'm going to use the default one. I'm not going to have my own custom receiver app listening. Okay? If you do have a custom receiver, when you register it with Google, you'll get a, a, a registration app ID for that, and you just insert that app ID there. Okay? Then we validate that a device is connected. Okay? So we created the session request. Now we're actually going to see if there are any receivers out there for our session request. If there aren't, then we're going to prompt the user accordingly. Uh, if there are, then we're going to display the cast icon so that the user can cast whatever we want them to, to stream onto the uh, Chrome stick. So once we get a successful session, okay, it will return a session object. That session object is our key for interacting with that session, calling any, uh, any commands, any of the API commands, and then finally, in the end, uh, terminating it. So sending and receiving messages. Very straightforward. We have a media object that's returned to us from load media. And load media actually takes in a uh, media info URL. Okay, so we're just passing across a URL. And based on that, we then get a media object. The neat thing with this media object is it's pretty much a full blown out media player where we can actually control the media playing. We can actually query properties of the media and the media player at that time. Okay. And then finally, at the end, we can terminate the session. Okay. And when we terminate the session, that terminates the casting itself. Okay. So it's that simple. It's really setting it up, communicating with it, and once we're done communicating with it, terminating that session. Uh, and then you can see how all these other companies are adding in their special receiver apps, and Google provides a lot of these samples that you can take a look at. If you're doing native senders with Android, uh, you install Google Play services, which is an additional area. And in that SDK of Google Play, uh, there's the Google Cast SDK built into it. So you actually don't have to download Google Cast independently. With IO iOS, there is actually a sender API li library. You download and install, and you link in that framework straight into your project. Okay. With either of the native, because you're not working inside the Chrome browser, with either of the native, you will need to handle the device selection at, for that user, propagating and showing the user what devices are available, and then allowing them to, to select which device. Okay. Chrome handles that as a browser uh, with its extension for you. Okay. Just some additional resources. There's the developers.google.com slash cast. There's also Google Cast under GitHub, where there's lots of, lots of examples, including a hello, a simple hello, some uh, multiple device communication to one receiver, a custom receiver app, some really neat and interesting things going on with this casting environment. Okay. So let's talk about futures, some possible directions and some new things that have happened in the space uh, just literally in the six, last six months. 
So where do we think it will go? Uh, the ecosystem, we believe, will continue to consolidate. What's that mean? Well, right now we have media players, not only in mobile devices, now we have it in sticks, we have it in TVs. Most likely that's gonna start consolidating where these media players live. Uh, we see it in receivers as well. It can come from uh, Blu-ray players, smart players, a uh, whole wide range. Physical footprint, this one still up for debate where it's gonna go. We have media player boxes that have separate remotes, standard remotes. We have streaming sticks, which you use your mobile phone for a remote, although there's actually some sticks that also have their own separate uh, remote control too. So the next evolution of this, who knows? It might completely disappear. It might be all in, built in to some of these other physical devices that are presently in the home, okay? Programming will include more effort and budget to customize websites and ad campaigns uh, with the synchronized timing. So you can see from what AMC has done, they've spent a tremendous amount of time and resources on building these companion apps, synchronizing that content, okay? And I would definitely see more experimentation around how do we monetize, how do we drive business around this second screen, okay? Okay, some challenging recent IP. Not sure if anyone's heard about this, but back in uh, June, Apple was awarded a patent that they filed, and the crux of it is it displays the downloaded content at time synchronized to time offsets from the start of the program of the presentation signals from the media player. Okay, so what, what Apple has patented here is a method where they can actually deliver movies, shows, online TVs, inf but information around that such that from a mobile device, from a second screen, I then have time offset information being provided. Where they take this, not sure, but it seems like a definite fit into things like Apple TV, okay, where they're already streaming media. Now they can propagate out to other devices what media is being viewed and where it is in that content, and we can do things like purchase. Uh, in this case, the shirt the actor is wearing. I think they also gave an example of the, of the drapes in a certain scene in their patent application. Uh, so some very interesting stuff around the IP going on here. So some questions to ponder, and then I had uh, one trivia question, and whoever gets the trivia question, I apologize for those people viewing it live, but whoever gets the trivia question gets this Chromecast uh, to take home with them. So questions to ponder. Second screen has without doubt become an integral part. We've all seen that just from the numbers alone. So even those people with reservations as to how exactly this will be used in the future, I completely agree. You know, that's a uh, unknown area, but just from the numbers of where people are using their mobile devices, sitting on the couch predominantly, and now interacting with content provided uh, by the programming. Where will the second ex screen experience be in six months? Not sure. Where will, where, what will happen with the hardware device landscape, as we said, with the sticks and primary screens? Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the Chromecast and if third-party developers take a hold of that. And then one of the more interesting areas, and at least for us in uh, home automation too, and I think in general, is the new wearables space. Uh, can this be considered a second screen? Already there are people playing with watches, being able to remote control your TV programming, okay? So is that considered a second screen? And if so, how do we interact with that? How we provide valid content that helps engage and drive us users and viewers of the programming? Okay, so before we get to Q&A, here's the trivia question. You gotta scream it out. Who is this? I heard it over there. Who said it? Big Buck Bunny from Blender. So you can get it after. Okay. It's what we all use in video and have for years for open source uh, video testing. Okay. So Q&A. Uh, from what I know, this will be posted, this presentation. 
Okay, so you'll have it available. Uh, there's my email address as well. And uh, inside this presentation, there's lots of references too. Uh, so you'll have those available if you want to do some further reading or uh, information. Otherwise, I definitely appreciate you staying for the last session of the last day. And I think we have some, uh, some time for questions, if there are any. No? Everybody wants to uh, catch their planes or go to the beach. OK, well, I'll stick around. <laughs> Did you have a question? Go ahead. Absolutely. So the question is, uh, what other examples of second screen experiences are being used besides AMC and, and tweeting? Uh, there's, there's, by far, AMC is the largest that have employed it, right? Uh, what we're seeing is sports is definitely getting behind this. So NFL, you know, partnering with Twitter is a, is a big one. We'll have to see where that goes. Uh, we're seeing a lot of individual show programming. And I think that may be a budget-driven uh, scenario, where a specific show or series will have a set budget around this and then start employing custom apps. Uh, you know, if you look at where custom apps came from, or companion apps, as they're being called now, uh, a lot of it was be being driven around promotions early on. You know. Uh, uh, where I have users actually register for early notification of a series and, and maybe uh, a raffle going on type of thing, but a very specific. I might have a website that drives it. Now it's getting more into this companion app. And so I think we'll see more around it for specific examples. There's some in the references here, uh, but it's much more around specific shows and, and the content around specific shows. I think like I said, a lot of it's being driven by budget, so they're trying to use tools that are already out there, like the Twitter feeds, like the Facebooks pages, and try to keep those costs down. With some of these results from AMC and the engagement, I would see that increasing, and I would expect that we'll start seeing more companion apps, and possibly from the actual programming channel rather than just the series that's going on. Okay, but the, if you look in the references, there's there's definitely some others. Good I, question. I had, I had one quick follow up to that too, and that was, um, do you think there's opportunities for smaller players to, I mean, smaller content publishers to <coughs> to take advantage of casting just from web pages? Because like JW Player, you can now cast from if you have the enterprise player. So if you control your own site and you know you're putting together pages, like let's say Joel and I wanted a fishing show, right? And I want to. Uh -huh be able to cast the video uh, from our site to the TV, but while it's playing, I want to show Amazon.com buys for lures we're using during the show. Is that, is that something that you think is an easy achievement because it doesn't re require native apps or, you know, I don't have to invest in a whole software cycle like that? Or, like, I don't even know if that's possible in a web page. Can you, can you do that kind of thing with casting? A absolutely. And that's the whole reason I showed the Chromecast because that opens up a wide spectrum of possible solutions, especially for the uh, lower budget endeavors. So that that receiver app can be playing on the Chrome stick while your sender app can be looking at Amazon or tying into, okay, I'm now at this point in this video feed, show this item to the user. And there's a real opportunity there I think it's actually a huge opportunity, and people aren't uh, seeing it yet. But items like the, Chrome, the Chromecast here being so cheap for users, and as this, as this model, I think, gets, gets more mature and integrated into other devices, not just specifically the Chromecast, uh, and maybe we get some standards around it, too, of how to interact with these media players, you'll see that more and more. Yeah. I think there's a huge, for example, uh, we called it last year v-commerce, video commerce uh, opportunity here. Yep. We're still very early in that cycle. You know, very few people are, are looking at other uh, monetization methods besides the old standbys of ads and, 
and the like. Question over here? Uh, yeah, I just have maybe a, a comment and then a question. Sure. Um, I was thinking of who else is doing it. I was, I, you know, as a consumer of lots of media, and, uh, you know, I have four kids, and everyone has an <laughs> iPhone, and we are just, oh, you know, yeah. it, it's, I, I don't even know what kind of brain cells we're frying, but, uh, uh, you know, the AT&T U-verse app's pretty impressive, and I can watch my recorded DVR on the iPad, I can scrub through it. It's got some interactivity. It's more of a hybrid type second screen, but you know, I, I think that you know the industry is kind of heading their way. They're not quite sure where to where to where to land there, but I think AT and T is at least pushing the envelope on that end. Right, and that brings up a great point, which we didn't mention in the slide deck, and that is what happens with those last mile providers, right? In this model, are yeah. they going to actually start trying to capture this second screen uh, viewership and? like AT&T, I fully expect that they have to, yeah. right? Too many people, too many eyeballs are going from the TV down to their devices during the program that they're going to have to not ignore it. They can't. Yeah. And, and at least so. I'm staying in their universe so that I'm sure they can monetize that somehow. Yeah. And yeah. then my next great, question is, great comment, by the way. as a publisher, I, I publish online, uh, we do live streaming, we do events just like this, actually. We, you know, my team could have done all this. And, and so I'm thinking, as you're giving your talk, could I have a second screen for the audience and they could be following along, the triggers could be happening, we could be interacting with your slides, Absolutely. all of a sudden hit play, and, I, you know, and now maybe I'm bringing my viewer away from your talk a little bit, but it's all part of it. You know, it's all just another augmentation to that. And heck, <laughs> maybe I could get some sales from the audience if they love so much what you're talking about. Because I know my boss, you know, VP, he just wants sales. You know, I have to come back with great ideas, but I always have to say, how do I make right. money on it? <laughs> so, so two comments slash ideas on that. One is that might be my next talk is actually doing it with that. Uh, I had problems with the hotel network because, of course, they require the validation page. Uh, but that was my hope was actually to, to get some in involvement where you can have multiple devices. That's first one. Second comment is, Again, I think that's a huge opportunity. Don't think just this venue, but think retail as an example. There's a screen, I'm in a you know, uh, barber shop, shop or whatever, and I want to interact with it, I want to choose my own programming. Uh, this could easily allow that, right? I can have multiple devices attached to it. And I think that's one model that people have, again, not uh, become educated on. They're thinking much more that I have a single device, I stream to that single media player, and I'm done, right? Uh, here it's much more the bi-directional. And the other thing is, by having multiple devices connected that, to that one, now those devices can also communicate by relayed messages. So I actually am creating a social network almost, a micro social network in that venue that I'm at. So you might display a comment and, uh, this gentleman over here might post a response to you, you know? So there's this very interesting dynamics going on. But again, we're still, I think we're still very young in this field. Very young. But that's why it's so exciting. A lot of opportunity. Other, other questions? Thank you. That was, that was good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for staying. <laughs>